Sa Jim Sanborn received numerous awards and grants and has exhibited in major museums in the United States, Asia, and Europe. His major public artworks are located around the world and right here in the headquarters of the CIA. He's always pushed the boundaries of sculpture. Without provenance is just his latest provocation. These your, your words. I have been trying to entice Jim into showing here since we opened in 2005. I have succeeded. <laughs> joined tonight, uh, we are joined tonight by Gary Vikan, an internationally known medieval scholar. He was the director of the Walters Art Museum from 1994 until 2013. He doesn't know this, but he taught me by example that a serious scholar and an art museum director could also be terribly funny. <laughs> Vikan's most recent book is titled, appropriately enough, Sacred and Stolen, Confessions of a Museum Director. So we're in for a treat. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to these gentlemen and hopefully we can have a discussion uh, after a while with, with you in the audience. Thank you very much. Uh, just to start this off, Jack, thank you very much for inviting me. I started my museum career in Washington about a mile and a half from here, maybe two miles at Dumbarton Oaks. Uh, so it's a little bit like coming home. Um, and in fact, we lived in McLean Gardens. I'm pointing that direction. You needn't turn around. Uh, McLean Gardens, which you may or may not know, used to be a rental property. We moved in in 1973, and the rent for one bedroom was $115 a month. So, uh, yes, lots of good memories, and uh, a great privilege to be here tonight, seeing some familiar faces, and meeting uh, Jim and his wife at the farthest southern reach of the eastern southern Maryland in a magical little spot where I hardly expected to encounter Khmer sculpture. Uh, so when I saw this, and when I had that catalog in my hand for the first time, took it back to Baltimore, went to a major collector, the major collector in Baltimore, the arts of the Himalayas and South Asia, sat opposite him at his desk, put it down, pushed it across without comment, and he looked at this piece as reproduced right behind me, and he said, spectacular. And I knew uh, Jim had achieved a, provo a provocative show. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. And as we move on into this hour, I look forward to engaging the audience with questions. If you don't have questions, you don't have your head sewn on. So go ahead. Um, thanks, Jack. I appreciate it. Not everybody could handle this show, the weight um, or the size of the elevator or all of that stuff, the danger involved in erecting a 20,000 pound sculpture in a new museum. It was tough, thank you. Um, everybody's a collector of some sort. Humans, it's just part of human nature to collect something, whether it's buttons or bugs or anything. And. Um, my show certainly isn't an indictment of collecting. Um, it's a very narrow um, show, in a way. And um, it was largely inspired by my youth. And um, I, I collected a lot over the years. Um, back in the 1960s and 70s, I collected dinosaur skeletons and <laughs> gave them to the Smithsonian until the Smithsonian they had quite a few of them, so then I started giving them to universities. And so, because I felt this, people weren't going to see things if they were in drawers. My dad was a director of exhibitions at the Library of Congress, and one day the Dead Sea Scrolls appeared on his desk in 1960. Just about time I wanted to do a term paper, or, well, a high school paper. Um, and, you know, I picked one up. What couldn't do that today? Um, a few years later, I did an installation at the Virginia Museum in Richmond. And the Virginia Museum has a wonderful collection of Egyptian mummies. The only problem is that you see them 
through this glass, bulletproof glass window way down in a tomb, right? So there's no connection. So I found one. I found an Egyptian mummy and a mummy case at another museum, uh, a private museum, and they loaned it to me. And I was seen walking around with her, cradling her during the evening, trying to figure out where I was going to put her. And her ear piece of her ear fell off and her hand fell off and I, I wired her back together. We had a very intimate relationship. <laughs> and so I decided I, I, wanted her to be, I wanted her to be right out there where people could get inches from her um, to get the experience, get that magical experience, Howard Carter's moment, you know, going, seeing King Tut's treasures through a tiny hole. And so I, I mounted her on a sandstone platform, more or less at eye level. And then I strung super fine monofilament in front of her that you couldn't see, and it was lit in such a way you couldn't see it at all, so that you'd walk into this room, and you walk forward, and you hit this, what feels like a spider web, which, needless to say, deterred people from getting close to her, but still gave them this magical feeling of being in a tomb, you know, in Egypt someplace, and coming upon this mummy in this beautiful mummy case. So, a few years after that um, experience, um, in the early 1970s, I went to Egypt um, a couple of times and made a, a, a pilgrimage to the tombs of the nobles in the Valley of the Kings. And a small village boy led us down this long set of stairways and with mirrors reflecting the sun and you could go down there and you'd see these amazing paintings on the wall and fingerprints of the artists. And the paint was still wet. In one, of these, in, one of these in one of these tombs of the nobles, there were these perfectly cut rectangles, cut out of the wall, two inches deep, maybe 20 inches wide, 15 inches high. There were two of them, just cut right out of the wall, gone. So it was just white wall behind them. You know, I said, oh, this sort of messes up the feeling in here, doesn't it? So it's those events and that really led me to this devotion to antiquities and objects, which I, at one time I find very exciting, at the other, at the other, on the other end I, are very challenging because they, um, in some ways you want to possess them, in other ways you want to protect them. And so that's, that, that's, a, that's, that's a universal problem and it's getting more problematic in a way. So, just after my Egypt trip, I did a commission for one, at that time, one of the wealthiest families in the United States in the late 1970s. And I was working down by the guest house by the lake, installing one of my, the, my very first commission that actually allowed me to build my first studio and started my art career. And so I'd been working for about two weeks um, in the corner of the property and all of a sudden, one day, the owner, an old family friend, came running down to the lake and says, Jim, you have to see, you have to come up to the house, you have to see what I just got. I went up to the house, I looked on the wall, and there were those Egyptian paintings. I don't think they were the exact ones, but they were certainly the same scale, same size, same, same tombs of the nobles, the whole thing. So, years later, um, after doing my nuclear period, as ma many of you might know, where I recreated various things, um, I decided to cast about for w what am I going to do? What am I, I going to do something about Italy? Am I going to do something about the looting in Italy? Am I going to do something about the looting in Syria? Am I going to do something about the looting in Peru? You name it, Greece, wherever, Iraq, wherever. I wanted to do a show about looting looted objects. And I fairly quickly came to the realization that it was a logistical problem. There were several problems. One was expense. How, how was I going to mount an exhibition of objects or about looting without objects? How was I going to get objects that were convincing enough to fool scientists and more or less everyone into thinking that they were real? And how, where was I going to do that? Well, serendipitously, when I was working at Glen Echo Park many years ago, um, several people from the Freer Sackler took my 
um, course there in foundry. And we cast a Chinese mirror made out of zinc. And one of the young assistants, um, I remember very distinctly, was very curious and interesting. Well, it ended up nine years ago that Paul Jett uh, became the director of conservation at the Freer Sackler, specializing in Khmer. So um, I said to myself, okay, I can, if, if I do it in Cambodia, um, I, I've always wanted to go to Cambodia. I tried in the 80s to get into Cambodia, and it was too early, it's too soon after the Khmer Rouge. And um, so Paul helped me with two of his assistants and someone at the Metropolitan Museum directed me to artists in Cambodia that I might be able to commission um, to make objects for my looting, ex my looting installation. And so I wanted to make, I wanted large objects and I wanted small objects. I wanted all sorts of objects. And I went to Cambodia the first trip and in the first trip, I collected all of these small pieces, I mean small by I mean 100 pounds each, and I, I brought them into my hotel room. I kept piling them into a corner, right? And um, because I was gonna take them all back on my Emirates flight because I could get them through without anybody looking at them. And at the time, you couldn't get antiquities out of Cambodia because you had to go through Thailand. And Thailand closed everything down because of UNESCO's rules about antiquities and the Thai government decided that it was incapable of determining real from fake. There's an interesting thing about antiquities, in stone antiquities in particular. Most every other type of antiquity is datable to the day it was made, either chemically, visually, whatever. Stone antiquities, on the other hand, you can date the stone. Hey, that's millions of years old, but you don't really, can't really tell. Even today, you cannot tell the date it was carved. So that's one reason I used stone antiquities because I realized that, you know, there was this immediate uncertainty about it. And um, so I went over there and I gathered all my sculptures in the corner of my hotel room and the hotelier kicked me out of the hotel. He assumed I was looting antiquities. That I was stealing them. So I had to pile them all in the back of a car, drive to another hotel, that my translator, who I'd picked up on the street, um, told me about, and I was dubious, but I ended up staying there for seven other trips. Um, and so they didn't think I was stealing antiquities. And so that was my first foray into it, and I, I picked up these, these brand new objects. They're carved out of gray sandstone, very hard material, carved by hand. No power tools used beyond roughing out the object, roughing out the large stone. And um, so, I, 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 had, I brought these back to the United States, and then I went about trying to figure out how to make them look old, okay? So I'd roll them around on the ground, I'd beat them with sledgehammers, I would do everything you possibly can without destroying them, that's a tough thing. Everyone's seen that glorious torso. You know, most museums have a glorious torso. It's a Greek, Roman copy, whatever it is, but it's a glorious torso that looks as if it it looks as if it belongs in the golden section handbook, okay? And everything is perfect about it, it's just right. Forgers are very good at that, right? Forgers are really good at making things look just right, like this guy right here. This fellow right here is, what, is the father of the sculptor that I used to carve most of my pieces in that room. He's the father. And um, this fellow over here is the father of most of the forgers in Cambodia. So those two gentlemen, I'm glad they're in the room. I wish they were here physically, um, but so anyway, so I, I gathered all these sculptures. I, I made tables and tables of testing. I did all sorts of testing of chemicals, acids, every sort of acid, just hundreds and hundreds of tests on how was I gonna make this believable. Second trip to Cambodia, I figured I'd pick up some larger pieces and I was talking to my shipping agent. My shipping agent said, well, um, you know, I ship these things out of Cambodia all the time. And I said, well, well, who's making them? I mean, who's making, who's, are these, these are looted objects. And he said, these are real, I said, are these are real objects that you're shipping out of Cambodia? And he nodded his head. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. 
And I'd like to take you to somebody um, to show you some. And so he took me to the ship gentleman on the left's compound. And there's another picture of, of a whole bunch of pieces laid out on the ground down there at the far end. And they presented me with this whole room of objects, some of them this size. And at the time, I told him, I, you know, I, I told my shipper, um, you know, what I, was gonna, what I was doing, but I still wanted my shipper to think that I was actually going to buy something because he would probably get farther with him. And so those objects and this, ob this object were offered to me for about $75,000. And, um, and so I finally, I, I admitted to the guy, the, who I call the general, I admitted to the general that, listen, I'm, I'm not going to pay $75,000. I'm a sculptor. I am going to try to make my own fakes because I'm doing an installation about looted antiquities glaring at him because he has all these objects on the floor in front of him. And so um, basically I, I hung around the compound as much as I could and um, learned. He took me around. Most of the sculptures that are carved, he has numerous people around the town of Sim Reap, Cambodia. Individual artists who get a chunk of stone from this guy a big block of stone, and then with just hand tools, cars, an incredible piece like this in about a year. And just by himself, it's, it's the carver, the pieces on the ground, or it's standing on the ground supported by a tenon that sticks down from the bottom here. And he carves it all by hand, and then um, polishes it until it's glowing. It's just mirror finished polishing. And then sells it to that guy. After he supplies the stone and then he sells it for, I asked him, what do you sell these for? This young kid, this young man, a descendant of Khmer artists, an orphan of the Khmer Rouge. He said $750 for a year's work. So he sells it for $750 to the master forger. The master forger then proceeds to beat it up pretty severely. And you can see down in the, in the other room, in a couple of these images, there are some sculptures sitting in um, depressions in the ground in a compound somewhere in Sim Reap, Cambodia. And it's soaking in nitri pure nitric acid, 100% nitric acid. It sits in there for two weeks. The first time I found one of these, I snuck into a forger's lair after I figured out where it was, when nobody was there. And I went in with my translator. And I moved a board and uncovered the plastic, and my translator passed out. The fumes were so horrendous that it was a bad scene. So we got out of there, covered it back up. I took pictures of it and realized that the water table in Sim Reap, Cambodia, is being poisoned continuously by nitric acid that's seeping in from all of the forgery operations around Sim Reap, Cambodia. Um, and so part of the thing that I tried to do when I finally ingratiated myself to the forgery community, which took quite a while, took six years of um, cajoling, uh, subterfuge. Um, there was one instance where when I first started, when I was first got to Cambodia, I met an archaeologist, Martin Polkenhorn, who's one of the world's foremost scholars of Khmer antiquities and determining what's real and fake, what are the uh, stylistically. And um, we became good friends. And fortunately, Martin keeps kind of a low profile, so the forgery community didn't know Martin. So basically, we found a Range Rover. We found a fake Rolex. We found a little bling. I dressed Martin up like a really wealthy buyer from England. And we went back to this, the general's compound. And those pieces on the ground now became $125,000. And my archaeologist was able to look at each piece and tell me which ones were the best ones, which ones would pass at an auction house auction, which ones would be in a museum collection, which ones were trash. But we're talking high-end antiquities, uh, high-end, sorry, high-end forgeries or high-end um, reproductions or, as I like to call them, contemporary antiquities. So... So Martin, we get back, we compare notes, and I've, I've taken surreptitious video. It's interesting because an iPhone will just fit in this pocket, 
and just stick out of the top a little bit and I can just run it. And so I got that frame grab, that guy in the pool there. That's just a single frame grab for my surreptitious video of catching them in a pool of water, cleaning off an antiquity just prior to when they can dry it out and then offer it for sale. And so I finally, over time, by making people believe that I was potentially a source of sales for these people and a, a larger source for people like bringing my archaeology friend with me, and eventually we became friendly with the sons of these guys, of the forgers. And it's really a familial operation. There's one family and then there's, there are actually two or three families around Sim Reap, Cambodia that do this. And um, I took them all out to dinner one night. And at the fanciest restaurant in Sim Reap. And we all had a really great time. And the last trip I made to Cambodia, um, I asked them, uh, would you guys mind if newspaper article was written about this project because my friend Martin Polkenhorn had published an article in an in a, in a online um, scholarly journal called The Conversation. And apparently the Nam Pen Post editor had read The Conversation article and wanted to do an article about the forgery in Cambodia. And I said, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait a minute, what's going on? This, is, could, this could be really ugly, this could be bad. Um, because I, at times, there were no question, there were times in the very beginning of my walking around the forgery trade where I, didn't, I wasn't sure about my security at all because people were very hostile. They did not want to give up secrets. They did not want to deal with this. All they wanted to do was sell work, and I was kind of, you know, I was, I was a competitor. Well, interestingly... Um, the first, I, I, I'm sorry about backtracking, but the, one of the first trips I went to Cambodia, I went to visit the Cambodian National Museum. And there is a, the head of conservation there is named Bertrand Porta, and he's a Frenchman. And he told me that the, one of the sculptures that I visited had been sent into exile in Sihanoukville in southern Cambodia because he was doing forgeries. This was about three years or four years before I got to Cambodia. And at that time, forgeries were very scorned uh, by the U.S. and other NGOs that were helping Cambodia rebuild their temples. So they exiled the forgers. And then after a couple of years, they realized after looting had really taken a toll in the 1980s and 90s, they realized, how are we going to replace these sculptures? So they brought the forgers back. And they put them to work in the National Museum to replace the sculptures that have been stolen and now their sculptures get stolen. <laughs> Which is great because the real ones are still there and that's sort of the gist of why I've done what I've done because I feel like today the forgers or the high-end high -end antiquitists objects are the salvation of a lot of the great temples in Angkor Wat. Because on the one hand, yes, they're muddling the art market because they're so indistinguishable from genuine antiquities. Um, but on the other hand, um, the more of it, it was that, it, the last, one of the last two times I was there in, in Cambodia, um, I talked to my shipping agent, and my, who I got to know very well. And he told me that, um, well, Jim, I first told you that everything that I bring out is forgeries, is real, I'm sorry, is genuine. Well, in fact, they're all forgeries. And there is almost, there are very few genuine antiquities leaving Cambodia anymore. And it's to, to such an extent that museums no longer buy any antiquities from Cambodia because they can't be trusted. They're almost always fakes, and genuinely, they are fakes. And so that's trickled over into auction houses. That's trickled over into museum collections. That's trickled over into global antiquities trade. And there are many museums now that have a large number of forgeries. And there are also museums that have a large number of looted antiquities, and they're slowly being returned. But still, it's difficult to determine a real, real one from a fake one. Strangely, I gave the Metropolitan Museum Conservation Department the very first piece of a guaranteed forgery. <laughs> Sounds weird, 
But if you don't have any to compare, to compare against, then how do you determine it? How do you figure it out? So they needed this thing that I had watched somebody make, that I had taken videotapes of somebody make. And so they now had a benchmark. But it hasn't helped because the forgers are so good and the forgers can penetrate the surface of a stone the same distance that a thousand years of nature would take. So, and, and they can penetrate the surface of a stone with a chemical it, it, in such a way that the color that's imparted is, is, it corresponds to a particular period in Angkor Wat, whether it's 7th century, whether it's 13th century. They are so skilled, it's just incredible. So the last day I was there in Cambodia, I, the last trip I made after the newspaper article, um, I was leaving on the airplane and I had brought over many, many um, new antiquity, new pieces. I couldn't dare bring over anything that looked remotely real. I was, because I did not want to get accused of bringing real things over. That would kind of be, defeat the purpose of my exhibition. So basically the guy came over to my hotel and he says, Jim, do you remember that sculpture that was in the back of my forgery place? The same place where those, those ladies are in the acid. And he said, I've got this piece and I got this mortgage. And if I don't have my mortgage payment by this month, I'll lose my whole compound. And he offered it to me for $2,500. Well, I mean, I took it. And, you know, it was like, it was still hard. I didn't know how I was going to get it back into the country I, because it appears so real. Its feet weren't connected. Um, and it's, it's a little difficult. You might see out there in the gallery, there are many pieces. There are foot bases, foot pedestals. And most all sculptures have foot pedestals. And then extending down underneath, there is a tenon. And some of the tenons are very long, particularly in the earlier, earlier sculptures. And so you get a large piece of stone and you stick it in the ground, you make a point, and you stick it in the ground and then you carve the piece. Well, he didn't come with his feet and those foot pedestals and his foot pedestal um, were broken off because dealers in Europe, Singapore, China, wherever, Dealers have determined that people are not used to seeing Cambodian sculptures with feet <laughs> or tenons. And how do you mount a tenon? A tenon is a weird thing to mount. You can see all my foot pedestals out there have tenons and I had to make a metal frame to suspend the tenon, but I actually think the tenons are kind of great looking. So this guy, so they had to break all the feet off. And so those feet that I have out there were like dime a dozen. They didn't want them. The gallerists didn't want them. As far as I'm concerned, so many of the antiquities that you see today, small pieces like this that have no feet or arms, sometimes no heads, to me feel like tragic war, war victims. And so it kind of spoils the feeling. And so I reassembled this one. I reassembled the one down there. I, I carved the feet for the one that's in the hallway down there. I reattached these feet. I've had to carve many, I've carved some of the feet back in some of these pieces, but nonetheless, I had to have a piece of theirs for me to use so I knew exactly tactically, visually, how do they look, how do they feel, and I wonder how they did that. So, have I missed anything, Gary? No, I think you, I think you got it. Uh, oh, yeah, one thing. I, I did miss one thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so, pardon, I just had my knee replaced a month ago, and so I'm a little gimpy here, but... Sotheby's catalog. My catalog. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I do want the audience to get involved. <laughs> One quick question. Uh, in the storyline, and you imagine yourself having gone to Peru or to Greece or to Italy, and a similar series of events may have unfolded, but you went to Cambodia in part because of the 
conservator yep. at, uh, at the Freer. Um, did you encounter the first fake, real questions in the marketplace? In other words, you just went to the market, saw things and bought them? How did you actually begin to penetrate this whole thing? Sotheby's catalog. No, but I'm, I'm sorry. But I buy, but, but, well. On the ground, when, you, when you're in Cambodia and you want, let's imagine you were to do this in Greece right now. Yep. What would you do? Find a shipping agent <laughs> who's willing to tell me who the, where they're getting their objects from. Uh -huh. And I think that's pretty universal. And it was something I just stumbled on. Um, you might notice down there, there is a shipping document um, from, the ban uh, from the Cambodian Ministry of Culture. Um, that shipping document's used a couple of different ways. They can use that shipping document to ship a genuine antiquity out saying it's a fake. They can ship a fake out saying it's a genuine antiquity. Real easy, real switcheroonie here. And so it just costs a couple bucks. And um, so that's sort of the way it's done. But um, as to the question, if I'm in Greece, yeah, I'd find a shipping agent. I'd allow the shipping agent, tell the shipping agent that I'm getting ready to export a whole lot of antiquities, and could he help me out? Uh -huh. And he'd probably find somebody. Interesting. So at the beginning of Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, mm -hmm. he tells the story of the Getty Koros, bought in 1985 right. for nine and a half million. A bit taller, but not right. so different. Right. And how some people could tell instantly that this object, despite the fact that it had been put in a bath to artificially age the marble yep. and to fool a geologist at UCLA or someplace, which started right. the dominoes of authentication. But some people, apparently, intuitively, in a blink, could tell it was bad. Well, okay. So my archaeologist is a big help. And um, he has excavated hundreds of Cambodian sculptures. He has discovered many sites. Um, there's just re recently discovered this huge new complex on top of Mount Kulin in Cambodia, but using LIDAR. But he pulls these things out of the ground all the time. And the key to it is, Nobody ever made one this size. They were all about this size. So it's, it's stylistic. And if you know the styles of a certain period, whether it's 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 12th, 13th century, if you know the style of that period and you know the dress of that period, um, you can tell instantly that it's a fake. Um, the other tell, of course, is if you recognize it. Mm -hmm from some museum collection. So this fellow here, you can see standing next to photographs of various pieces. He uses these as inspirations, and he also carved the one on the left, which is in a very famous museum catalog. And his father carved many before him that are in major museums around the world. And so, you know, who knows? Who knows, so do you expect uh, curators from Cleveland and the Met and Cleveland, just recently, Houston um, to come and take a look at these things? Um, I have no idea. I mean, I don't know if there's interest. I don't know if there's the inclination. Uh -huh. um, there are, there, there's one piece I've got here. I don't know. It's around the corner over there. And it's sort of, at least on the wall, I have a, there's a, there's a photo, each piece is accompanied by an auction catalog page. The top information is, is usually correct for the style, the style, the year, the date, all of that for that piece, that style, that's all correct. The provenance at the bottom, yeah. The price, obviously, if it was sold at auction today would be far higher than um, if you were to buy one of those out there, but anyway. Um, the thing about it is, um, that particular piece that's out there, um, in the provenance, which I wrote, which is historically based, based fiction, okay, so the provenance, the center section, really, these things do happen. There is a Pyongyang restaurant in Sim Reap. 
they have a sculpture garden out back of Khmer antiquities. So this is not unreasonable to have had the provenance that I wrote about. That piece, the piece that's outside there, um, in the provenance it said, unfortunately this piece um, was knocked off its pedestal during a fundraiser for the museum <laughs> and it lost its head. And in the process of losing its head, the conservators realized that there was no penetration into the stone. Right. So it was an obvious forgery, but nobody wanted to tell anybody about it because it had been donated to them for six figures just a few years before. That's the biggest issue, and that's a very difficult one. And um, it's not something that none of these problems are going to get solved quickly. No, they're not. The, uh, the collector that I showed the catalog to, right. who said spectacular, right. once he figured out what you were up to, right. went through a litany of forgeries at well-known museums that he was aware of, and I believed him, going back to the 60s. Right. So could you imagine that the curators and directors of these museums that own, have bought them, or have been gifted these things, uh, using this little wedge, which is not so small after all, and to begin to roll back a whole history of fakes in museums around the country. I mean, could you imagine that the onus would be on them to show that it doesn't match this? Well, as opposed to the I wish you could be uh, so optimistic. Um, my shipping agent gave me other documents, like a pile of documents. I was just blown away. He gave me a pile of documents, and one of the piles of documents was a consignment of 15 pieces to a major university museum in the Midwest. The director of there that museum... There are only two. Hmm? There are only two. Okay, fine. <laughs> Northern, northern Midwest. Okay, fine. Um, and and um, so the, the director of that museum had just been, had a new museum built for him by a new donor. And the new museum was occupying a large portion of the campus. And so they needed to acquire a collection of Khmer antiquities. And so I looked at this piece of paper and I had met this director. He had come to my show, Atomic Time, at the Corcoran many years ago and wanted to show it at his museum. And so I was stunned. It was like, it can't be this small a world. And so I, I called him up. Well, I didn't call him up. I emailed him. And I said, what's the deal? You, you bought a bunch of these pieces from uh, Cambodia. And I'm just curious whether you know that they are all forgeries. And um, I didn't get a response. <laughs> And I didn't get a response, and um, about two months later, I looked at the museum catalog online, and there they were, 12th century, 13th century. So this was just a couple of years ago. Yeah. I'm going to do a, a little experiment. OK, you ready? Yes, sir. So this is for the audience, and you get to vote by raising your hand hand, one hand per vote. Goes this way. Looking at this, forgetting for the moment everything you've heard about it and maybe have read about it by now, realizing that there's history, authenticity, and they're not the same as experience. How many of you actually care aesthetically that this is a fake. How many are bothered by that? Raise your hands if that bothers you. If it doesn't bother you, let's see your hand. Well, I would say it's 60, 40, or 70, or 65, that's better, 35. That's good. That's good. So most of you are not bothered by this thing being fake. This has nothing to do with politics. <laughs> A 
let's just leave that. Um, so if that is more or less generally acceptable, and if the aesthetic experience, let's imagine that for the moment, for most of us, and I include myself in this category, it's very subtle and an issue only among hyper-specialists whether or not the upper lip might be slightly off, right? And a lot of these hyper-specialists are making mistakes, that's clear. So what's wrong? We know Lysippus by way mostly of copies. We know the great Greek bronzes by way of Roman marble copies, right? And we don't think two or three times that this is somehow contaminated. Same is true with Chinese painting. So what? I mean, that's really your thesis, isn't yes. it? I would hope so. I would hope so. And I, <clears throat> I mean, I would hope that ethical collecting is on the rise. Um, I know it's, I mean, what, <clears throat> Interpol and the Italian government just seized 20,000 objects a couple of weeks ago and raided, you know, 23 countries, or, you know, and it's just, um, it was interesting that the writer of the article I was sent yesterday um, said that the biggest problem, the writer said that the biggest problem was that it was, it was the fact that Beautiful objects, often highly religious objects, whether they're Buddhas, whether they're Shivas, whatever they are, are, are shown and handled in such a disparaging way. I mean, this particular one had a Roman head on an Afghan carpet with the person who photographed its feet in the photograph, and the TV was on over here, right? Well, it's not that far away from any of these. And there are a couple of, there are a couple of these objects in, sitting in basically dumps. And it's, it's unfortunate, um, but I think originals might be treated just the same way in the forgery market as these are treated. Um, the forgers know they're fakes, but they're also working really hard. And um, That same article went on to show the installation at Cleveland. Right. And the photograph was taken maybe two years ago. Right. And an object to the left, which they bought, I think, in 2014 for some millions of dollars, right. had been stolen out of a museum in Naples right after the Second World War. And it had gone back. So it invited the reader of this article to understand the thing on that carpet. Right. And the thing in that beautiful museum installation right. is essentially the same. And not knowing where to stop. In other words, if that piece on the left in the photograph of the Cleveland installation is looted, what's to say the next one and the next one? Because there were about 30 pieces in the photograph. Yeah. Uh, and for better or for worse, I think it's a puzzle, for better or for worse. Uh, the presumption now is increasingly that the object is suspect. Right. Not that the object is clean. Right. Yeah. No, and that's... Um, Give you an example. So good. It's on my, in October of 2017, the International Art Fair in New York City was raided right before the gala opening. It was the 29th of October. Three cops and two prosecutors went in and they seized a small relief from uh, Persepolis, Persepolis. There is a not quite twin to that piece at Dumbarton Oaks. There is a sister to the twin at the Walters. Cleveland has one, Minneapolis has one, Wooster has one, Harvard has two. <laughs> so, I'm wondering to myself if those cops and those two prosecutors are so eager to seize a $1.2 million stolen Persepolis antiquity right. in the armory, why the hell didn't they just go up a couple more blocks, actually a mile and a quarter, go into the Met and take, take two more? 
<laughs> um, and I give that example only because once you begin, where do you stop? It applies both to the genuine, looter, right. and to the fake, which at least don't have the problem of being looted. Right. And that's everything for me. How about the audience? Way at the back. I see a hand in the light. Would you stand up, please? Is there anyone? Thank you. Is there someone who can evaluate the authenticity of the fakes? In other words, how good a reproduction are they of the, the work that they're intended to reproduce? Stylistically easy, easy. Um, chemically, at this point in time, impossible. So stylistically, yes. But stylistically is a weird thing because you never know what's underground. <laughs> so there might be a piece that comes up that is this size with this style and dress that hasn't been discovered yet. And um, so you can only go so far with a stylistic determination. Um, I mean, the Getty has one of the best laboratories in the world for determining this, but they're far from foolproof. And... Um, so, just for stone. Everything else, not a problem. Second row, here. Yeah, I was going to say, aesthetically, I have no problem at all. Oh, sure. I was going to say, aesthetically, I have no problem at all with the copy. I think it's great, actually. But I can see that um, legally, I, well, I was wondering, did you deal with, you know, I know the Cambodian uh, authorities, you know, they do, you know, they get a lot of training with the FBI. And I was wondering if there's any enforcement on that end. And then there's the additional issue of if there are forgeries that are being passed off, then that might involve things like tax fraud and stuff like that. So I was just wondering if there was any, um, you know, any of that being addressed. Well, um, there are a couple of things there. One is that um, the Cambodian government makes, government makes significant money from the export of a lot of stuff. And the current government being what it is, um, that's not going to stop anytime soon. And um, the thing is, um, the forgers, and I made it very clear, I said, listen, if you guys, and their pictures were on the front page of the Phnom Penh Post, the forgery families, and they were proud to be there and they're fine today. Um, I just impressed upon them, listen, you're not making forgeries. You're making high-end reproductions. If somebody buys it from you, sells it as real, you're not in trouble. They are. So that's the, that's, that's the line that they draw. And that's the line the government holds on to. That's very important. And so I try to make it very clear to operate that way as best you can, and also try not to use nitric acid. In the front row, and then back to the gentleman with his hand up there. Uh, you first, you second, okay? Jim, tell me if the um, alleged forgers or reproducers, do they give any kind of provenance or artificial provenance or, you know, or something? Is there some, because you're, you're distinguishing something, and so someone has to have some kind of document, I would think, right? Or is it the, the way it's bill done. of lady? The, the, the way it's done, basically, is that even when I exported this, when I exported this piece here, um, basically it was, you know, leaning up against a tree, and the base was over on another side, and an official, a local uh, from Simreap, came over with a camera and photographed it, and then produced a document for my shipping agent that said this was made in a particular workshop uh, by that guy's brother. Um, it goes sails away. So, um, but the same can be true the other way. But fortunately, much less today. So my, my shipper said, and I really, by this time, after seven years, I do trust the guy. I mean, he gave me his everything. And um, he said, there's 
99% of what leaves Cambodia as um, antiquities or objects are high-end reproductions. Um, my question is about the, the broader field of uh, antiquities and artifacts, artifacts. And it's motivated by the, uh, the recent fire in Brazil. I don't know whether you saw oh, that. God. Where the museum was uh, destroyed. So for, for special objects that are truly, or to the best of your ability, known to be authentic, to what extent is it museum practice to digitize those objects so there's a, a record of them? Well, I don't know. I'm not a museum professional. So I can't answer this question specifically about that horror that occurred down there. Um, all I can say is that it does certainly give credence to that group of collectors who are convinced that they're collecting to save the objects and they put them in museums. Well, museums are not infallible. Museums burn to the ground. Personal collections, we had one a few years ago locally, hundreds of objects burned up. So private collections and public collections can be destroyed. Wars happen. Taliban happens. Um, Bamiyan happens. Um, so it's, it's a really tricky thing, and I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think everything now, I mean, I know that the Egyptians are 3D scanning everything. Interiors of tombs, objects, everything's being 3D scanned. And I think that's extremely important, and that's moving very quickly. Um, and I think that's, that's one way of, of recording objects. But the problem is the, the forgery trade has been happening since the 1950s. And this, the grandfathers of these guys were forging objects right at, you know, before the Khmer Rouge. And um, I based my show entirely on objects from the Gamay Museum in Paris because in 1870 they went in and they brought, brought out Hundreds of, hundreds of objects at that time, and they have collected very little since. So I trust what their objects, I trust that their objects are genuine, and I trust that their objects are um, a collect, were collected and given to them by the Cambodian authorities at the time. Well, although the French ran the place, but so that's a little shaky, but. Um, it's a little like the Elgin Marbles, but, you know, there was that argument about the Elgin Marbles. I mean, they were, they were supposed to have been saved. And it's true, they do look a heck of a lot better than the marbles that are still there in situ. But, back in 1936, some artist was hired to clean them and completely redid the surface of all of them. And, you know, sanded them off. So, you know, Museums aren't necessarily always the best, safest place to put things. With that, Jim, museums aren't always the best places. Um, I'm going to cut this off, recognizing that he will be available one-on-one -on -one or four-on-one or 19-on-one in perpetuity, and with you all thanking him, Jim, for your provo provocative show. Thank you. Thank you.